Good afternoon. My name is Yasmina Sisrak, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Thank you for joining us for our fourth COVID-19 webinar. The webinar series are presented by the Health Matters Program in the Department of Disability and Human Development at the University of Illinois at Chicago through continued partnership with Project Search and their funding from the Ohio Developmental Disabilities Council in collaboration with Aspire Community Services in Illinois. These summer webinar series are meant to provide a space for community providers to share their experiences in maintaining services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we will be recording and archiving the webinars and an email will be sent once the archive uh, is up on the on our YouTube channel. Um, during the webinar, please note your questions in the chat box and we will ask these questions during the last 15 minutes of the webinar, so I'll be just collecting them. So for today's presentation, I wanted to introduce Kathy Service. Her presentation will be talking about COVID-19, resources for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. A little bit about Kathy. Kathy has been working in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities since 1976, first as a registered nurse, and since 1979, as a nurse practitioner, both in institutional and community settings for the Massachusetts Department of Developmental Dis Services. She was one of the first RNs nationally to be certified in the specialty of developmental disabilities nursing. She has served on the steering committee of the National Task Group on Dementia and Intellectual Disabilities since the, since the inception and truly believes that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, their families and their staff are her best teachers. This presentation will discuss strategies, resources and tips to support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to understand what's going on with COVID-19 why do we need to take precautions and how will protections help us? Additionally, we will discuss how to advocate for legal rights and reasonable accommodation and provide you uh, numerous resources um, that are available um, online and free of charge. Again, please ask your questions in the text box. Everyone is muted except Kathy and myself. Um, and then again, thank you again for joining us today. And uh, Kathy, I will pass the presentation to you. Welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for being with, with us here. Um, and I tend to be a fast talker, so I'm really going to try to speak slower, so bear with me. Uh, Yasmina is being my slide master, so I will tell her to advance the slide. So the next slide, please, Yasmina. All right, so this is really me, and that's Leon, my dog, and I hope he will not start barking during the presentation. But I wanted to just to say a couple things here is that we all know, those of us who've been around during this whole crisis, is that it's rapidly evolving, and what this presentation is going to give you is current at the time. And um, what I'm trying to share with you is the latest of what is ethically and scientifically known. And although I'm a nurse practitioner, the information I present is for the purposes of education, and you really shouldn't use it in place of the advice of a healthcare practitioner, either your own or the people you support. Next slide, please. So, are we ever, anybody ever gonna drink Corona beer again? Uh, it's like pretty sad. So, this is the overview. And I won't get so much into advocacy work for legal rights and reasonable accommodations, but I want to let you know is that because of the advocacy of such groups as the AADMD, the American Academy of Doctors and Dentists in Developmental Medicine, and beyond, um, hospitals and state agencies must now modify no visitor policies to accommodate patients with IDD. And additionally, early on, because of its advocacy work for the marginalized group, even uh, in my state of Massachusetts, I live in Western Mass, and my local hospital is affiliated with Mass General. They looked at their policy on crisis standards of care and the determination of the use of limited critical resources. And because of people advocating, they modified its policy. Next slide, please. 
Okay, and this again is to reiterate, it's dynamic. So what I'm giving to you is right, is current. Although here's an advertisement from the, the flu pandemic back in 1918. Next slide, please. So back then, even then, hand washing was important. So the thing that I can't help thinking about is the, and I guess I'm gonna call it information integrity. And I have to admit is that uh, this picture of Dr. Oz, when it came to me, it came from some medical uh, newsletter I get, and it said, CDC recommends Dr. Oz wear a duct tape mask. And I thought they were serious, but it turned out it was just playing a joke. But there is so much information out there, and we're bombarded at all times, you know, we're on internet, blah, 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 blah. And I find that even our well-meaning friends and family, you know, will tell us things and, you know, they might be half-truths and they mean well. So. The, the key point is to try to go to reliable resources, and I have some kind of listed here. And in, all of these resources actually have a lot of free, the key is free information. A lot of things are written, they're recorded webinars, and are free. So I'm just going to talk to you about some of these. The CDC and WHO, Centers for Disease Control, and the World Health Organization, they have a wealth of information, and we're going to look at the CDC in a little bit, but the WHO, there's, there's recordings, there are posters, anything you could use and want to use for um, your um, agencies are available there. And then you have specialty groups like the National Task Group and on uh, Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia, and that's my group, the AADMD, the AUCD, and for people who don't know what that stands for, it's the Association of University Centers on Disabilities, the LEN programs and USEDs are at that. And then the America, uh, American Association of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, and the International Association on the Scientific Study of Intellectual Disabilities. And we're gonna look at their website. They have some good, good things at their website. And then, you know, go to your state, and I'm sure those of you who work in, and are working now are probably inundated either by your Department of Public Health or your Developmental Disabilities state agencies um, and departments. And then last of all, our own city public health department. And I just want to have, note this quote that I got from the Adult Down Syndrome clinic about information and that the amount of information about COVID-19 can be overwhelming and cause anxiety and stress. And our mental health is just as important as our physical health right now. We recommend staying informed about the situation, but limiting to the amount of time spent following news and social media. So to be aware of these things is to take things and not get so overwhelmed as I think many of us and myself included did, especially initially. Next slide, please. So this is speaking of the CDC. So he, the CDC thinks it's so important. Um, the federal government that acknowledges your important. They say that direct support providers are considered to be the same general risk category as healthcare personnel, and they are essential to the health and well-being of people they serve. So to be aware of the, your value. So. Yasmina, do you want to try to click into that first one so we can kind of show people? We're not going to spend a lot of time, but into that first website. If not, um, okay, great. Here, here's what one of the CDC. So just to kind of show you, you can scroll down it. You know, what? who are they? What do they need to know? So it gives you a lot of, it's a lot of clicks on how you protect yourself, coping with stress, et cetera. So there's a lot of information about face cloth masks. You know, at some point, you know, you even click on there. They have the Surgeon General showing you how to make, how to make a temporary mask, et cetera. So what happens and what do you do? So these are the general guidelines of the CDC. So and additionally, they also have a, a clickable site. You know, and we don't, we're not going to get into the other ones there, but I just want to tell you on for group homes and discussing factors of what could influence the spread in group homes for people. And then they have one for behavioral disorders. And one of the ones um, that they, they talk about that in, on the other ones is that uh, people with ID are, are not naturally at higher risk for becoming infected, but they, unless they have underlying medical conditions. But they also comment that they may have difficulties accessing information, understanding, or practicing preventative 
measures, and communicating. And I know from my work with all of you over the years is that you all know people you work with. You can tell if something's not quite right. So interestingly, um, I'm, I've got a comment on one of my uh, gerontological nurse practitioner websites about old, older people and that, that they don't show fevers and that when they're infected, they might seem to be a little bit off. And, and so it's, it's just, and I made some comment back about how this is just like the people we work with. And so to be aware of, you know, people instead of showing fevers, and this happens to be because of what happens to older people in general, um, they may not show the same symptoms, but you know the people you work and support with. So um, trust you and report on things. The, the other thing the CDC also has is that a special section on uh, health disparities for Black and Latino communities. Next slide, slide seven, Yasmina, please. So, okay. Oh, Kathy, just yeah. to add, I'm adding the direct link to um, CDC right. uh, website in the chat box. We will also, I've also shared it last week, but we will also post it once we archive your webinar as well. Oh, excellent. That sounds great. I think that's an important site. It has a lot of information up there. So here are some possible resources. And we're going to be, Yasmina's going to be, we're going to be giving you a little taste, tasting, a testing of, tasting of some of these. And I'm not going to go into each of these, but the first one we'll go into, I mean, I'm just going to make one comment about Green Mountain Self-Advocates. This is great. And these one of the first group of people, they're from Vermont. They have uh, information by and for people with disabilities, plain language, glossary, et cetera, tips. But let's go into IACID. And this website is um, it's great because it starts off um, where you, you go into it and it has a listing on COPE. There you go. So let's go into the Spanish plain language information on coronavirus. And you'll see, this is what was developed, and here it is in Spanish, and if you scroll down a little bit, it's all the same information that's in the English speaking. So if you have families, if you have people, um, you know, for yourselves if, to, make, to help you understand better, this is all in Spanish. So this is available, in it, and it's also, so it gives you an example of what's available on the IACID website. So we can go into the next one, Yasmina, into the coronavirus social story via Easter Seals. Here we go. And this is another one that you, if you need to be able to use it. So if you click on it, it's a social story for people um, to understand about the virus itself. And, you know, it's really interesting. Much of the stuff I, I found is maybe more for kids, but it, a lot of this stuff is make, trying to make it so that people can understand what you're talking about. And this, this information is really basic, but it gives you some, some sort of indication that information that you can use with the people you support. Oh, there's the birthday song or count, or count to, to 20. You know, how many of us, I'm sure I know that Melissa did a lot of um, training with you on infection control. Okay. So this gives you something that you could use. So we can go into the next one. Thank you, I will stay safe and healthy. Autism Speaks. So what should the autism community know about the coronavirus outbreak? And this is a little bit, it, it also has some, some information there about hand washing. It has um, what you as, as supporters of people um, with autism can do. Um, any, what about events that happen? You know, how you can kind of help the, how the care providers for, for people that you support with autism. There's a, there's a couple other sites there with autism. So this is another a site that's available and has free, free information. Um, so in your own time, you know, please go into these sites and kind of check them out and find things. And not every site will be able to meet all your needs and I'm trying not to overwhelm you with information, but so, and then one of the other sites is from Australia. Again, because IACID is, a, is an international association, so I guess we can go into why are there are lots of new rules. It's a fact sheet. 
And so, you know, um, that one down the bottom, it's a little towards the left. So if you go into it, it's an easy to read, um, you know, a lot of pictorial things about why do we have all these rules and about the virus. So it could be, you know, people are questioning what's going on here and why do we have what, what we need to know here. So there's new rules. And that's the other thing, like keeping spaces between. Read the, we have a space between ourselves. Pubs are closed. The pictures are closed. And so there's a lot of, you know, information that reaffirms to people so that they understand. And the main point of all of this information is to, to get to communicate, to get the information, to help also reassure us and tell us, you know, that this is what is happening and how we can support each other. So there you go. Here's some, that's some of the other ones. So we can go on to the next one. Oh, very interesting, very contagious. This is a site that the Beyond Words, and I can appreciate this is from Great Britain, and usually they sell, they sell these booklets, these books. They're like um, graphic novels, if you want to say, and they're usually charge for it. But all of the coronavirus, they have about four or five of them, are for free for download. So do look at them. I can appreciate the one that I found pretty meaningful is you know, about somebody who dies. A friend of mine, when somebody dies from coronavirus, it's a guide for family and care is the one. And my friend with ID um, had one of his, his friends without ID died early on, and he didn't quite understand about why he couldn't have a funeral and things like that. So you can see these books and you can use them and try to support the people that you work with. So the best of all this is that right now it is free and available for you. So next week we can go back to the original site and we, we can focus on there is a Down Syndrome Medical Group and this is local next to you all in Chicago and it's a great great center. They also have a resource guide and I wanted to let you know, although it's, you know, focused on people with Down syndrome and much of the, the information seems to be more focused for younger people, it's still applicable. So let's click on the link and we're going to scroll down and we'll look at their, their resources here. So you'll find there's that question and answer on COVID-19 and Down syndrome. Get that. Um, I was actually the national task group worked on that early on, and I helped to contribute to some of that. So it's a great booklet, and it's very and it has been updated. So a number of people um, have it. It's available in Spanish and English. Is an, I would probably get the abbreviated version, but it's great for you. It's great for family members. It's great to have for all of your programs. So feel free to share it with people that you. You're, you work with and, um, and, 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 and support. So the other thing, if you go back, uh, Yasmina, to the original resource list, if we scroll down and look at, oh, there's some great things on activities you can do at home, you know, and they also, there's a month, when, with all of these resources, great sharing amongst each other. So, um, you know, again, here's the Green Mountain Advocate. So one of the ones there's, there's two, and we're not going to get into right yet until we get to the slide on testing, is that the wearing of face masks. So if you scroll down to um, uh, the wearing of face masks, there's lots of things in Spanish, let's talking about it. But the face mask is, is a, um, a travel, so you can see work activity considerations for people with Down syndrome. So the face mask things. Wearing a, again, they have information from the CDC. There is on one point. One of the the points is using the. Um, I think we we can click on either the for the the social story about COVID face mask. So you have a lot of social stories that you can look at and share with the people you support on on wearing the. I can wear a mask. It's a social story for visual learners and people with Down syndrome. Um, learn um, better visually. So here's something that you can share with people about the coronavirus and what about it, what symptoms they can have, and you know the face mask. 
um, the importance of it and where you go to wear a face mask. And I think initially that was a little complicated because initially we did not wear, we weren't asked to wear them. So now we have to use them. The other point I want to talk about face masks is always, in, it, you know, because people aren't going out for day programs, um, people are, may not be used to wearing face masks. So we need to be able to kind of acclimate people. And we'll talk a little bit more about face masks because, you know, as things open up, people will be going out and they will need to wear face masks. So keeping people used to wearing face masks will be key. So, um, so the next one, I mean, they have, you know, again, you, the other, we're going to go back, wearing can be uncomfortable, and we'll go back to the original slide on, um, we'll come back later, Yasmin, because we're going to do some little complicated work here, but there's that possible resources, and the next slide, please. Um, here, here are some of the ones we already looked at. You know, you can look at your look at them on your own time. There's some Canadian great Canadian resources. Next slide, please. So testing. And what can I say about testing? You know, um, it's there's two types of tests. One is from the antigen, the germ itself or the virus, and it's the PCR, and it looks at the amplifies the genetic material and detectable if the person's actively infected. And these tests look for snippets of the virus's genome, or its RNA. But what they can not tell you is that the finding is evidence of a live virus, meaning an infectious virus. Because once a person fights off a virus, some particles, virus particles, tend to linger. They can't cause infections, but they can trigger a positive test. And the levels of these particles can fluctuate, which means how a test could come back positive after a negative, but it doesn't mean at that point a virus is active. But I think the point is, and we're still learning about this, but to get the information. So um, let's go into the, the Down syndrome about the testing site. And I'll tell, I had the test last week, and as a nurse practitioner, I'll admit that until you have something happen to you, you don't have a sense of what it really means. So, Yasmin, if you want to go back into the Down syndrome site and pick up the testing. And there's that, there's a video of the testing back on the other site with testing itself um, prior to, on, on the main site there. Uh, I think it's, you have to go back another earlier link. Okay, great, thank you. So up above, there's a, there's a, you have an actual point about testing. And there's two videos on here. One of them is um, a video for adults, thank you. And the other one has to do with um, for kids, and it's a little bit more um, cartoonish with jaunty music. And um, uh, Kathy, sorry, yeah. I don't. Uh, the, where is it? Is it on this site? Yeah, it's on that page. Go up a little bit further. I so I apologize. Up a little further, I believe. There you go. Helping a person tolerate testing. There it is. Okay, I can't play the video because it's going to slow down. Every it's like it's gonna okay. be off with the okay. video and sound for some all people, right. so I'm okay. not gonna play it. Okay, that's quite all right. So what I'll just tell people about it. It shows you about how a test is done, and basically, you know, they've asked you to push your head back a little bit, and I can tell you for myself, and they stick this long nasal swab in you, and they they twirl it around and they get some specimen and they test it. And the thing about it is that it's burning when you go in and last week, and you can see right there, you know, what it looks like. So you can go on here and look and get an idea if you haven't had the testing done. And uh, you know, for me, unfortunately, when they stuck it in my left nostril, they couldn't get in. I think I have a little deviation. And so they had to take it out and do it again. And one of the things, you know, it reminds me again, you know, my friend, I have a friend with ID who has an exaggerated gag reflex. So, and I know, I mean, when I'm trying to help him and cut his nose, nasal hair, is that he gags, he wrenches. So I cannot imagine having it done. So I think some of this information, you know, and I know from those of us who've been in the field along, maybe, you know, if the test is really necessary, People might need a little bit of uh, 
pre-medication or sedation to help them relax and, and get the test. So to be aware of this is what we have right now for this testing. Again, this is the testing for the antigen itself. Okay, so we can go back to the uh, or back to my original slide. Great. Uh, next slide, and that kind of shows you the same thing. So about antibody tests, and what they are is that they are antibodies testing is really um, the antibody is a protein that your immune system produces to help protect you against infection, and there they can be IgG, which shows up earlier than the IgM, and so to be aware of it, they're markers, and they start to show up um, in most people. We don't know how long they last, and it, it reminds me of years ago. I don't know if how many of you were around when hepatitis B became um, first um, was first detected, and the different kinds of tests around antigen and antibody and the length of time and and you know how long you'll be protected, and then when you have a vaccine, how long that's good for. So to, to be aware of these kinds of things, I think right now we don't know, but um, always always pay attention to what's up. The other point I wanted to bring up around antigen antibody testing is that you probably heard the term convalescent plasma. This is the plasma of people who have already had the disease but have no residual virus, but high loads of these antibodies. And what we're trying to do, people are trying to give them um, other people who are uh, like using this as a vaccine. With some, so it's giving somebody else's antibodies. It's almost like the measles vac vaccine. So again, we don't know, you know how long they're going to be good for and how how strong they are. Next slide, please. Kathy, just a couple of questions. Does the yeah. does the test hurt? Testing hurt? The the testing on the antibody, the one that the tube that you that goes up your nose. The swab. I am assuming yes. For me, you know, it's a little uncomfortable. I think the worst of it um was the burning, you know, they, they, it's the alcohol, and our nasal septums are very, very sensitive. So it, burning could be interpreting as hurting, and it may be uncomfortable for some people. I didn't cause me to gag, but I could see people gagging. So to be aware of these things. And plus, as they're going in, you know, they do this twisting of the swab around inside of you. Um, so you, 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 you feel the things. And I think for some people, it's really difficult to, to be able to tolerate. I'm, you know, to be honest with you, I know my, when I when they first started doing some of this work, um, there was some, some talk about saliva tests, but I haven't heard anything at all. So I think it could be very, uh, you know, hurt how you decide that. People may think it hurts. And, I, and when you look at the site, you know, for the, for the children, people are, you know, it really upsets a lot of people. So to be aware of these kinds of things, it's not the easiest thing to have done. I mean, it, it, and I could understand it, but it was quite difficult. Um, you know, it, it really burned. It was, it, it was quick. You know, they went in, twisted around and came out, but it burned. Okay, so the next couple of slides are just a review of what Melissa spoke about in the other sections. Honestly, these are challenging time and humor is really, I try to relieve tension with humor. So, I mean, we laughed early on before the quarantine about the COVID shuffle. It's like you bump your elbows and on one side, your right arm, you bump uh, elbows on the left, eye, uh, left side, you cough into your elbow. So I think, you know, some of these things is how do we use humor to kind of help us through the day? So I'm, next slide, please. So these are just, again, you know, some of the things, the preventive things, and this is the most important because we don't have treatments. So how we can prevent, you know, any kind of, for anybody coming down, this is, the disease is key. The next slide, slide 13, is phrases we can use. And this is adapted from um, somebody from Orange Grove Center in Tennessee. You know, using the whole concept is we all together. And one of the things that I have found in, in, my, in my work over the years is that partnerships with people, the people we support and with, with each other and with our coworkers. And, you know, you can tell people, you know, telling people how you feel about the time and do something. And what do you do with these feelings? 
And what can you do to keep the house safe? So here are some terms that you can use. And then, you know, ask each other for help. Help me through this, please. And be honest about these things. You and I, we all know that people are really sensitive. They know um, what, what the sense of what's going on. So how can we support each other? Next slide, please. So here again is some issue about, and I hate the term social distancing. I tend to use the term physical distancing because social distancing, we need our social connections even more than ever. And we have to, but we have to modify whether it's uh, uh, virtually, you know, telephone, what kind of FaceTime, how do we keep connected to people? Next slide, please. So this is a, an interesting slide. This is one of the things that's available if you go onto the WHO website talking about gloves. We always think gloves are the panacea for things. The issue is, is people think they're safe. They got the gloves on. Okay, great. But if you have the gloves on and then, you know, you can pick something up on your gloves, and then you touch your face or touch some other object. That's not, that's not protective. So the key, regular hand washing, washing your hands the correct way, offers much more protection than um, wearing rubber gloves. Next slide, please. So let's talk about masks. And it can be so confusing. And I'm not going to click into this, but this is a website uh, from the University of California in Berkeley, and they, they talk about the different kinds of masks. So a couple um, things about masks has to do with, um, you know, wearing of masks and what kinds of masks you have. Um, oh, my goodness. So things like um, the, some of the masks, the different kinds of masks we have. There are things like um, making sure, you know, you're wearing masks out in public. And it, interestingly enough, I got something in one of my uh, medical websites talking about that they believe, this one study, and it, it's based on modeling studies, that the use of face masks may have prevented tens of thousands of infections in New York City and Italy after implementing mask making. And it's based upon, you know, their calculations. So, you know, they do make a difference. So as I was saying earlier, there's different kinds of masks. You know, you have your N95 respirator and surgical masks that should be saved and used for people who work with people with coronaviruses. And then you have some of the other ones, such as um, you know, ones that are made from cloth, cloth or synthetic material. And then such things like neck gaiters, you know, these things that we wear in the winter. I used to like, in fact, early on, my neck got cold, I wore these these kind of polyethylene or whatever they call those masks, you can put them on a stretchy synthetic material or cloth bandanas. You know, you have to kind of look at it at, in terms of, you know, when you're using them. The cloth bandanas tied behind the head might be uncomfortable for extended wear, making sure you wash our masks. So, you know, the important thing is, um, you know, the proper use, and we're going to talk about it. Next slide, please. So here's some examples of some of the masks. Um, some are mainly for healthcare personnel, although you know the, the face shield is an interesting um, piece of uh, a mask kind of mask. And I see a lot of um, people in some of the grocery stores wearing them. The good thing about it, I mean, they're usually used in hospitals because they also prevent transmission of wet particles. Like for instance, you know, when people when doctors are doing intubating people and you have a spray of infectious material. So um, they can be good. The, the other good thing about it, they can help people who depend on lip reading and, and reading facial expressions. You know, sometimes they're a little dorky looking at times, but they allow people to be able to see and um, serve as an obvious reminder of social distancing. Um, so this is one example. And, you know, the other thing is, is the other cloth mask, and we're going to get into that a little bit. You know, people need to wear, I see people out wearing masks incorrectly. You know, sometimes they let it dangle off the tips of their noses and they just keep their mouth covered or they readjust their masks frequently. And that can be, see, that, that's an important thing having to do with the, 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 the kind of mask you have. Or they take them down when they're talking to people. And, um, and then, you know, they don't, the important thing about masks that you need to remember is they prevent people from, no, 
um, they can prevent you from spreading germs to other people if you, you're you have you are infected. And the thing to remember is that we don't know always if people are infected, but but they don't always protect you. They may do that. We just not not sure. So the next slide, please. So. Okay, the hard thing about masks, and, and this is me, I couldn't get anybody else to, to model, is that people have said, I can't tell if my staff person, the person who's working with me is mad at me. So we know our, that we so use our facial expressions to communicate what we're thinking, how we're feeling, and can tell a lot about our state of being. And so for the people we work with who you know, sometimes language is an issue. They really look at our facial expressions. So let's think about some of the things that you could do. Maybe perhaps tell a person how you're feeling. And the other thing I think about is when I do a lot of work around dementia care is the tone of your voice. You know, the way you speak, the, the, um, the, the um, you know, the, either the, you know, if you're speaking lower and quietly together, people can kind of tell and, and talking calmly. So think about how you're, how you're speaking, the manner of some speaking. So can you tell, I mean, I can tell that's me, which one I'm mad at and not, and my, my wrinkles in my eyes give me away. So um, next slide, please. So, so how do we make masks fun? And um, I couldn't help to use this. So many of the men I know are with, with intellectual disabilities are wrestling fans. So I couldn't help to include this. So um, one of the things is that when using your face mask covering, make sure your mouth and nose are fully covered. The covering should fit snugly across the side of your face so there's no gaps. You don't have any difficulty breathing while wearing it and tied or secured. So what kinds of face masks? And, and it's incredible. I feel like I'm a mask maniac. Um, they're almost, you know, one of the things is when you look at masks, they're like, Fences. You know, there's different kinds of fences available, and depending about the kind of fence, it either will let some things, animals, people in, you know, or or um, not allow things to come in. You know, cows, horses, your neighbor, depending on the kind of fence. And so, what do we want and need? Um, and it's really interesting because early on in this whole process. You know, Many of us have neighborhood circles that they, people thought, you know, they wanted to be useful. They started making masks. So I got involved, sort of involved one, but my sewing machine really didn't work. So, um, but early on, you know, people were talking about the styles of masks and what kind of masks and how to do this. And there were a lot of videos and even now you can still find them. And then at one point people are saying, oh, you know, this is not really Say this is not really protecting the person. So at one point they were telling us, get your HEPA vacuum cleaner bags and take the filters off and put them in your mask. And then there's something come out, no, this isn't good. There's particulate in this and they can cause you more respiratory problems. And it got, you know, honest to goodness, I can, I mean, I was confused. So I can imagine, and I'm a nurse, so how confusing could it be to others? So. Uh, you know, initially, and I'm just going to tell you my mask making situation or mask buying, I bought some masks through the city and they're just jersey kind of material. They're very, very flexible. They fit around your ears. You know, the, there's, there's some that are made with regular elastic and there's some that are made like with t-shirt material. You know, they're, they're, most of the masks, almost all the masks I have are only two layers. So. All right, that seemed to be work fine. Then I bought a, a bunch of masks from this local group. The problem with these masks, they were ni nicely, you know, they're pretty masks and they were fun. They did not have, and either masks have, you know, they fit on the ear. They came across, they had some like a um, uh, flannel in the inside. They didn't have a wire across the nose. And initially I thought, okay, I could wear these but they kept sliding down. I mean, initially I tucked them under my glasses, but they kept sliding down. So they were a little challenging to wear. And then my friend, who's a great seamstress, did all this investigation. So she made me this great mask. It was a little bit more complicated to use. It had a nice shield. And um, when I first tried it, it was a little pouchy, so there was a little bit breathing space. I'll have to admit, I'm like, geez, this doesn't fit right. Well, it turned out I had it on upside down. So 
you know, learning how masks work. But she also, in hers, left a little, yeah, it's two layers, but if you want to add like a little filter device in between, you could do that. Then I got a bunch of masks from my friend of mine who made them down in Florida. She's a quilter. They are beautiful. They're kind of quilted. You've seen those on the side. You know, they, they, they're, um, you have to tie these. They don't go, you know, easily, but they're pretty and they're really lovely. I wish you could see it. This one's got pink flamingos, so it's lovely. My friend Jadine, who has a son with Down syndrome and is on the national task group. And lastly, you know, you can even use old T-shirts. And one of the things is that scientists are working to identify what kinds of materials best filter the particles. Find that a high thread count used for quilts and pillowcases work well, and you need to layer them. Um, to increase the filtration. You know, the, according to the WHO, they have a great video on mass, cloth mass. They I ideally recommend three layers, the outer, the water resistant, but you know, you gotta remember, you gotta be able to breathe through these. So, you know, you have to, you know, have a certain level of density. You know, an inner layer that is kind of absorbs your, breathe, your breath, which is, has some humidity, and then a middle, possibly, as act as a filter. I actually had um, a friend of mine just dropped him off today. Um, somebody made me a mask out of a T-shirt. And the, I had it, many of the people I, you know, support missed their day program. So I had a habit of a T-shirt that was of the day program that my friend goes to. So I had somebody else make it. And because the T-shirt material is kind of, Thin. You know, it's lovely to look at, and it's a great, it's got, you know, Riverside Industries, blah, blah, blah. She put the inner filter as a dense material, so it goes around the ears, and she also added another tie. So there are ways of, of <coughs> making, making masks and making them be meaningful to people. So um, next slide, please. <coughs> um, someone was asking about coffee filters. Yeah, I've, I've also heard that. Yeah, Would those yeah, work? yeah, they can work. But again, you know, try them. I think one of the things that the I mean, you read about these things, and I think you know, the best is, you know, they're 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 another layer. Putting them in again, you have to take them out, and you know, washing your mask and doing the right way, you know, or you know, some some kinds of paper towels are are a little more. They're not completely you know, um, dense where you can you can't breathe through and get hot. So yes, you can you can use those and try those uh, um, too. So these are making masks easier to use, and it's hard again. And one of the laments I hear I heard from this friend um, who's a director of a day program is that you know people aren't wearing masks at home. So what are we going to do if they come back in? How are we going to support people in wearing masks when they have to wear masks? So, you know, my my um, suggestions is having, making sure, even if people don't wear them all the time, spend some time having masks on. Even when you're in your social bubble and everybody's safe, you know, wearing masks is a good thing because it keeps people in the habit and makes it much more comfortable. So, you know, this is, you, you've got a couple, I'm not going to go into them, making masks easier to use, you know, trying to find out what about the mass is bothering them. You know, we have a lot of people that are tactile defensive and some fabric bothers you more than others, you know, that might feel more difficult. You know, one of the things, and this is, it's interesting for me, uh, and uh, again, you know, we always use ourselves as an uh, a point is that Making sure, when you look at a mask, you know, one of the things is to make sure it's, it's intact. But also look and make sure the inner part of the mask doesn't have any fibers or hairs across it, you know, inside. Nothing drives me crazy. I mean, and, and I know people can be sensitive to this, is having a hair inside your mask. I will be in the supermarket shopping and my face will be itching under my mask. Now, I know what that is, but you know, some of the people we support don't quite understand. And it's almost like, I mean, having, um, you know, we can't, you know, in a way, you know, I kind of think about humor and it's like the hair in the nose is like the 2020 version of, a, of having the hair in the back of our pants. And I'll 
you know, that drives us crazy. And you are not in the midst of the supermarket, not going to try to get the hair out of the back of your pants, just the same as you're not going to try to get the hair out of your mask. So try to plan ahead for these kinds of things and think about it, because these are the kinds of things that will make for failure. Um, next slide, please. So conditioning, and those of us in the field of conditioning, you know, using social narratives, visual supports, timer, you know, rewards, et cetera. And there's, there's actually a YouTube video that we're not going to get into, but um, so the next slide, please. So this is just something for your information, disability COVID-19 forms. And this Stony Brook University has these available for free. You know, some states have their own um, um, forms and others don't, so you can always download and look for your state. And then information, trans, uh, the communication of information from one site to another, if somebody gets hospitalized, or for instance, if a person has to go, some, some programs have people that are COVID positive, stay, move to a group home, different group home, et cetera, go into hotels. So, but always have forms on people. So you can use like your My Health Passport or Surrey Place in Canada has one. So this is just available for your information. Next slide. And the last one is keeping healthy. And really, keeping physically and emotionally healthy isn't new to all of us, and it's really important and harder, I think, than ever. And the more I listen to webinars, the more the advice seems to be reinforced. You know, it's important to get outside if you can, you know. It's the natural vitamin D is a boost to our immune system, plus the color, and especially now before it gets too hot, is really green therapy lifts our spirits. Routines are so key. Uh, again, almost all the webinars I st on stress management comment about the importance of routine. You know, it's with all this uncertainty, having structure in the routine, I think about is like having a hand railing. If they go up and down the the stairs of the pandemic. Um, structure routine, you know, sleep, healthy eating, visuals for people. And, you know, this was all reinforced by Dr. Brian Chacoin, who's in one of his early webinars with the Adult Down Syndrome Clinic. And, you know, our sense of well-being, you know, taking care of those, you know, both for yourselves, you know, understanding there's some things that are just out of your control, you know, and you need to be be kind, be kind to your others, and especially be kind to yourselves during this. The next slide, please. So, you know, from me, and I'm sincere when I, when I say this, um, you are all, those of you who are in my listening audience, you have all been my best teachers over time. And sometimes, you know, I don't know everything. But, you know, by your questions, and, you know, one of the things I, I'm hoping to do is to do something on uh, masks and personal protective health equipment for like uh, um, for people with, you know, that they can read. So, you know, if you have information or can kind of tell me questions like the whole point about what do I do? How do I tell my if my staff person's mad at me or not? So these are the questions we need to know. So you are all my best teachers and I'm forever, forever grateful to everybody out in the audience. So. So what really, who really matters? We all do. And if you have questions, no, that's fine, next one. So thank you all for everything you do every single day. Um, we would not be here without you. So feel free to, to call, you know, email me, I'm available. And if I can answer something now, you know, I will get back to you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you again for everything you do. Thanks so much, Kathy. Uh, please put your questions in a chat or question and answer box. Um, I have been asking some that came through, but I, I also have a, a few others. Mm -hmm. um, what about people with asthma and wearing um, face coverings? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think, you know, one of the things is people, people can wear, and they should wear face coverings. I think, you know, again, you know, it's interesting because some of the information I've seen is that the people with asthma, because of the medicine they might be on for asthma, there's less of a, um, you know, our um, autoimmune reactions to it. So there shouldn't be, to my knowledge, 
any issues with people with asthma um, wearing um, face masks. If they seem to kind of tolerate, you know, again, trying, trying the kind of mask on, but there shouldn't be any reason, you know, that they, they can't wear, to my knowledge, wear face masks. I haven't seen anything in the literature about it. Thank you. And I think you somewhat partially answered this question, but how might you help support someone with autism with sensory, specifically touch issues with their mask? Well, you know, taking time with pe people and having them, and again, you know, I'm thinking out loud here, so bear with me, you know, touching, feeling, you know, getting them used to the kind of fabric, you know, feeling across their face, you know, trying different things, rewarding people about, you know, how the mask is. And some masks, you know, for instance, if you have the ties in back, they may be much more bothersome. So around the ear ones, and sometimes the elastic may be more bothersome. So you might use, some people might use t-shirt material, which is softer feeling and may feel less um, uh, yeah, uncomfortable for a person with autism. You know, I, you know, I, think, you know, trying, you know, there are, as I was saying, I, as I tend to be a mask maniac right now, trying different masks and having people, you know, sensitized, feeling them around their hands, et cetera. You know, if you know what kinds of materials people may, may feel good to, to a person. Um, someone from the audience said, in our experience with masking family members with sensory issues, cloth masks seem to be much, much for, more comfortable with one long 30-inch tie that ties at the nape of the neck. So that's okay. a, All right. that's a um, I will just put that in the chat box so everyone can see that answer as well. Excellent, excellent. Th thank, thank you, Nancy. Um, what about face coverings for deaf individuals who lip read? Well, you know, there's where you get back into some of this is using the face shield, having a face shield, you know, people around, you know, for, well, also for people who are deaf and lip read, you know, the issues will be that there will not be, everybody will not have a face shield on. So perhaps making sure that if you're out with a person who lips read, that if you can help the person understand you know, having, if you yourself wears, wear a face shield and, and, um, and, and be, to be able to kind of like let the, you know, tell the person what the person is, the mask is, is, is saying, you know, these are, these are difficult times and we, we are going to make, you know, meet everybody's need, but that's what I would suggest right now. And using, you know, you yourself or somebody who, who that person can see is, you know, wearing a face shield that way they could kind of tell what's going on um you know the hard thing is like you can't be bringing face shields with you no matter where you go but if the person is tends to go in certain places frequently you know for instance if the person you know has a coffee shop or someplace that they really like maybe and again i'm thinking out loud here is you know getting a supply of face shields and and sharing them with a coffee shop or something and asking them, you know, if you don't mind when this person comes in. You know, the other thing in some of these places, you know, they, they automatically have these clear shields. So, you know, that that is all, that's all I can imagine, you know, what to do because, you know, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's the only thing I can think of right now. And I mean, if anybody has any other words of wisdom, I would appreciate that. And it would be interesting for me to go into the deaf community and see, you know, in terms of some of the um, deaf and hard of hearing places, what they may recommend. Yes? Um, a couple of, a couple of co um, comments from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. From Andrea, as a skills trainer, I find leading by example that they will wear when, uh, if you wear them. Yes. And then, um, um, uh, sorry, things are coming through, so I'm losing. Um, oh, uh, from Michelle, I've seen masks with anti-fog clear smile area for nurses and deaf community. Yeah. Oh, that's so, a good, yeah. So you could have, you know, technically, but you know, you have something to cut out where you could, you know, that that's true. I mean, you have to kind of look around for them, but thank you. That's a good idea or good remark. Can someone wear just a face shield when in public? 
You can, you know, as long as it's, it's the same, you know, the point of it is a barrier. And the point is, is that, you know, they are a barrier. And as you know, you've seen, and I've seen in the many supermarkets, people will just wear the barriers. So that, that also is, you know, what I would also quite honestly, and I think it's fine, but you know, with a, if you have a question like that, I always go talk to our public health nurse. You know, just check check in with them. But I don't I don't think that's a problem. Um, oh, good, that's great. Um, some um, uh, thank you, Charles. Someone was asking, do you know of a resource for getting the clear masks and or face shields? Um, so um, Charles from the audience uh, recommends that there's an Etsy shop. Um, what we've done, I, I can just share one of the stories Great. that we've done. Um, there are, um, if you look up on Facebook in your community, what, what they've done, there are 3D printing sort of groups mm -hmm. that print the, the print face shields, and they kind of, um, um, uh, are, they, they're able to make the face shields, and we've, we've been able to connect them with community-based organizations, and mm -hmm. they've donated thousands of face shields to nurses and hospitals and, and um, community-based organizations. So it's something um, to think about, to just uh, see. Um, I don't know if, if everyone is familiar with Nextdoor app. Sometimes we just post and ask for mm -hmm. donations that way, and um, it seems like there's always someone that's 3D printing something oh, for, really? for the frontline workers. So um, I would just kind of get creative with that too, but oh. yeah. Great, Desmond. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> um, oh, Ooh. someone said, I just looked on the CDC website, and they state you need to wear both um, and Ooh. not just the shield alone where mandated. Oh, how interesting. How interesting, because I see a lot of people out there who just wear the shield. Interesting. Huh. Oh, that, that's the first time because I'm actually, you know, one of the, the thing when I talked about it is that it was, a, it was a physician who was, was talking about the use of face shields as an alternative. Interesting. Okay. Um, shifting a question um, really quickly. Are there recommendations about how often or even if teachers or mentors should be tested so they are confident that we're not spreading COVID to our students or interns? You know, that's a hard one because you, you know, and honest to goodness, I could be positive now. You know, I was negative last week. Any of us could be positive, negative at any point. You know, the other thing about testing is that the rely, I mean, get, getting an accurate, you know, making an accurate test. I mean, they, they, you know, right now the tests are becoming much more um, reliable, but I have not seen any recommendations. You know, it's interesting how different governments are saying in order for you to, to go out or even do this and do that, you should get tested. But I haven't seen any recommendations yet about um, the frequency. And quite, oh my God, you know, to be honest with you, having, a, having that test done on a weekly or even a twice weekly basis is, is really, challenging and I don't know how you know the frequency of such what it does you know to the inside of our noses because it was really irritating I don't know if it could be damaging to the inside of your our noses that's an interesting point I'm gonna try to find that out um, also follow your organizational policy on mm -hmm. it too yeah. I think um, organizations are starting to have policies and I would I would ask and, and different states have different, you yeah. know, if, it's, if the testing is free or not. So that's. Well, that's a good point because sometimes, you know, I was, I, I, I personally thought I probably was positive. I had weird kinds of GI symptoms, but it came back negative and people said, oh, I bet you, you have it and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, you're right. And the cost of it. Um, one of the other questions was, can animals really get and spread COVID-19? Well, from my knowledge, you know, animals, and although, you know, there's, there is some, some sort of um, evidence, you know, the minks in, in the Netherlands, there are, you know, a couple of big cats, felines may get it. There's been some information about that. But you know, the issue is, 
you know, it may not be the animals inside themselves, but it might be somebody on their coats. And if you touch, you know, animals' coats or different things like that, that they, you know, you could get it from them. You know, there has, and actually the CDC has has information about animals. And in, in fact, that was one thing early on in that I contributed to the, um, in the question and answer on Down syndrome, if people have service dogs or pe people have pets that are important to them. So how do we do this? So at least that's been my knowledge. I would go to, you know, the website. Although, you know, for the most part, I don't think the animals in turn, um, unless felines, but, um, and maybe some animals can, but dogs, to my knowledge, but it could be on their fur. Thank you. We are at the hour mark. Uh, if you have any questions or still burning questions, please put them in the chat box. We were, we're going to stick around for a couple of more uh, minutes. Um, I just wanted to take uh, a moment to uh, say thank you, Kathy, so much. I think it, th these were, there are some really amazing questions. They seem simple, but yet there's so much stuff out there that it can get really confusing really quickly. Mm -hmm. So thank you for for sort of uh, explaining some of these pieces. Um, I also wanted to talk about June 23rd next week, same time, same day, impact of COVID-19 on organizations serving individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Donna Martin, Director of State Partnerships and Special Projects from the American Network of Community Options will be presenting. Um, I have posted the direct links for registration for that webinar um, in the chat box. Um, again, thank you. We will, um, we will stick around for a couple more minutes to see if there are any questions. Uh, again, the webinar will be archived. All the websites that we talked about, all the links will be there. So you can just, uh, it's, a, it's going to be a one-stop shop for you guys. Um, I'm getting a lot of thank yous and great uh, presentation and, and good um, resources, but um, no, no questions so far. So feel free to sign off. Have a great rest of the day, and hopefully I'll be seeing some of you next week. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, yes, the, the handouts. Oh, sorry, Kathy, go ahead. No, I was going to say, if there are any questions, you know, Yasmina, what I could do is if we want to, and I, you know, it's interesting, maybe what I can do is clarify a few things and send you the information. We could add that on, you know, a Absolutely. list of questions. That w I would love to do that, you know, the clarification, just to make sure about the asthma, say, for instance, and, you know, the whole notion, let me find out more about face shields per, per se. So that would be good. That would, I, want to, I want to do that for everybody. It, absolutely, we can add them. We we have our YouTube channel, and all the resources are added down where the more information or show more is. Um, mm -hmm. And also, it, it we will link it to our website. So, mm -hmm. um, and you will be emailed once everything is up. It's it's just um, we're running slightly late uh, posting it, but hopefully hopefully this week I can get this one up. So apologies for those of you who have listened on last week. <laughs> So, so thank you. Thank you, everybody. You, 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 thank you. And thank you for your questions. And do feel, you have my Gmail address, do, do Gmail me and remind me and uh, I can, I can do what I can do. I think we're just getting lots of thank yous. I oh. wanted to uh, thank Teresa. Um, the PowerPoint will be uh, will be available as well on the site, and you'll be able to download it, and the social story as well. So, so yes, all of that will be available. So mm. the, don't don't worry. We'll yeah. we'll make sure you have everything. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, Kathy, we did it. Thank we you. did. <laughs> Thank you. Was that okay? I didn't speak too fast, did I? I hope not. No, it was wonderful. Oh, I hope it was okay. You know, I...